looked out at the sea towards the oncoming ships. He knew what was coming towards them. Having received word from kingdoms to the north of an impending visit from a force with no name. The ancient Minoans had been sacked, the Mycenaean Greeks depleted, and while the rest of the Aegean crumbled in turmoil, the great pharaoh of Egypt, Ramses, with a steady hand prepared to take on the peoples from the sea. His chariots waiting, archers taking aim, and his foot infantry readying themselves for blood. These strange warriors hit the shores of the ancient city of Tanis, near the mouth of the Nile, met with the first wall of Egyptian arrows. These men held round, leather-covered shields like none the Egyptians had seen before. And as some were pierced by arrows, others broke through the threshold between the sea and the Egyptian forces. Seen from afar, cascading waves of bronze spears meeting with the oncoming horses. The next to come was blood. The sound of screams and clashing metal could be heard from the distant alleyways as Egyptian peasants scurried away into hiding where the Sea Peoples had arrived. Thousands of years later, we still do not know the origins of these mysterious invaders. Who they were, where did they come from, and how could an unknown pirate confederacy topple the most powerful empires on Earth, sending the ancient world spiraling into the Dark Ages. Join us on Into the Portal for an investigation into one of ancient history's greatest mysteries and one of the most important events in all of human history, the incursion of the Sea Peoples. Hello, and welcome back into the portal. I'm Amber Ray. And I'm Andrew McKay. And welcome back, everyone. Yes, welcome. We've got a brand new episode for all of you lovely people today. Indeed we do. And I can't wait to dive into this one. It's, it's cool. You weren't super pumped on it at first, but then you kind of came around throughout the week. You were like really into it the other day. and you were like, Oh, definitely. Yeah. I was just like, yeah, like basically talking your ear off about it. And you were like, hey, Amber, yeah, this is why we chose this. Yeah, exactly. I, I was already into it. <laughs> Pretty much. <laughs> All right. We ready to jump into this? Please. Let's let's do do it. it. All right. So we are getting into some crazy history, which we're going to make as entertaining as possible for you guys, because there's going to be a lot of different groups, a lot of names, and we're not going to get super bogged down in all of that. But yeah. So basically we are going to be talking about none other than the incursion of the mysterious sea peoples. And this occurred um, at the time of the Bronze Age collapse. So we're talking 1200 BCE. And yeah, basically the thesis of this episode or the main idea is that um, the devastation and the power vacuum uh, the Sea Peoples brought about at the close of the Bronze Age um, basically resulted in um, one of the most uh, tumultuous, important, influential Mm -hmm. periods of all human history. There was a lot of transitions, um, a lot of exactly that, like the power vacuum created a lot of openings for new developments, new prosperities and new technologies, which was obviously the bronze or sorry the iron age of that but essentially yeah this was a time of drastic transitions brutal falls of imperial powers operating in the region for centuries and it was also a time um, in which many hallmarks of civilization were lost for hundreds of years in like a sort of a mini dark age so yeah um yeah yeah, we're getting into it. Yeah, <laughs> it's really fun. And the the craziest thing about this story and, and and the history of the Sea Peoples is that hardly any, unless you've taken classes studying the ancient Near East, hardly anyone has ever heard of this before. Right. Like we have been asking people all week, mm-hmm. you know, um, in our family, friends, and stuff like that. People have not heard of this. They're like, "Are you going to do an episode on mermaids?" Is what people think, right? <laughs> We're not right, doing an yeah. episode on mermaids as much as I, I'm sure some of you are disappointed. Oh, I was dreaming title. about that, yeah. But Led by Poseidon himself. <laughs> Poseidon does have a, a sort of a semi-potential role in this in mm-hmm. a way. or um, But anyway, yeah. So we're getting in here into the end of the Bronze Age. And before the collapse, the Bronze Age was a very prosperous time. Um, mm. The empires of 
Egypt and the Hittites and the Minoans and the Mycenaeans, they were powerful people. And the Bronze Age was obviously known for bronze and because they was used uh, for weaponry. That's the main mm-hmm. reason behind the name, Tools, right? Tools, ornaments, a lot of religious artifacts sure. were made with bronze during this time. Yeah, so they had, it was a time when tin was a major aspect of trade because, of course, you uh, combine tin and copper, you smelt them together in order to make bronze, mm-hmm. and people discovered very, very quickly that uh, one way of doing this is with arsenic, but that doesn't bode so well for the manufacturers uh, coming out of it alive. So mm. they needed to uh, discover new ways of metalworking, and they did. And uh, this led to massive trade routes all over the world, um, mm-hmm. supplying copper and tin and these types of things. So like one of the main advents of this time, obviously, like you said, it's this ability to forge bronze. And that requires um, a lot higher temperatures. Off the top of my head, I can't remember. I think it was like 1,200 degrees for... I don't know. I'm not even going to say because that's going to be wrong. Whatever. It doesn't matter. You can look it up, but Definitely. anyone can look it up. But it's really cool, right? Because this, yeah, like we said, like an, an era, it's almost like a mini industrial revolution. Like we watched a ton of documentaries and saw so much information that basically points to that. And like some of the sites where these smelting factories were situated to this day maintain highly toxic amounts of the residual heavy metals right. and other elements that would have been left behind. Which is crazy. Which is really cool. And like yeah. the guy, I can't remember his name off the top of my head. He was an expert and he was basically saying like, this is way more intensive than I ever imagined just based on the trace amounts left. So a yeah. lot of powerful empires and a lot of commerce going on and a Definitely. lot of interconnectivity. It's almost like a mini globalization period, right? Yeah, within In this that one region. section of Europe and extending um, into Asia Minor and stuff like mm-hmm. that. Yeah, this was, yeah, an era of great wealth because of this, like you just said. Um, and it's evident in mostly because of the engineering marvels that we see at the time, right? Mm. So we have the enormous palace temple complex at Knossos on the island of Crete. We have the the fortified royal settlements of the Mycenaean Greeks um, on the islands throughout the, the Aegean. The Hittite capital of Hattusa in northern Turkey was a massive bustling city. The ports of Ugaret in Syria and uh, Tyre in Lebanon and these types of places they were they were they were massive. Massive populations, wealthy cities with kings that were extremely wealthy and adorned with the metals of the time Mm -hmm. because gold was another one that was very widely worked with, obviously. Right. Um, So this is a sort of a snapshot of the Bronze Age, like all the way from Egypt to the Black Sea when, Mm -hmm. you know, the world was, you know, if you weren't in the main centers of the Hittites and the uh, Egyptians and the Minoans and things like that, the rest of Europe was essentially a series of powerful tribes and kingdoms. Right. So let's name those. Okay. So we do have the uh, Mycenaean Greeks. So that's like in the Peloponnesian sort of peninsula area. Yeah. We do have the Hittite Empire. Hittite? Is it Hittite, Hittite. or Hittite? The Hittites. The Hittite. Hittite. Yeah. Such a weird name. Uh, anyway. So that's modern day Turkey. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. So over there on that uh, far eastern side. Mm-hmm. And then you get the Canaanites that are a little bit further. They're more in like um, where Syria is today, that type of thing, um, in the Sinai Peninsula. And yeah. then you have the all powerful. Egyptians and they've got a massive empire in the south. Right. Uh, so that was really the main players. There were obviously islands like we mentioned, Crete. Um, there was also uh, Macedonia uh, in the in the south. Or sorry, not in the south in the west. Yep. <laughs> Let's not confuse everyone. <laughs> this is going to be a challenge for it's okay. me. Okay, <laughs> just go slow. Don't exactly. Rush. So just think about it as a big circle of all these powers, and they're all on the coastline of the Mediterranean and the Aegean Seas. Yes. And so it's this nice little pocket of civilization that's about to be disrupted by a bunch of pirates and (laughs) crazy people. Essentially. Yeah. Um, You know, the picture we're painting is that it's all kind of hunky-dory powerful empires. There's a lot more detail behind Mm -hmm. it. And we're going to get into some of the reasons why a pirate confederacy was able to topple these empires. Exactly. Maybe they weren't as strong as we think they were. True. But at this point, tail end of the Bronze Age, we're coming up towards the uh, the the year of around 1200 BCE, mm-hmm. and things take a drastic turn for these empires controlling the region. Totally. Yeah, so we get what is known as the Bronze Age Collapse. <laughs> <I'm just laughs> a very say. fitting uh, description, yeah. <laughs> I feel like Todd Campbell right now, yeah. <laughs> our history professor. The Mycenaeans decided to attack him. <laughs> <laughs> no, we're not doing that today. <laughs> 
Okay, so as we alluded to, this was a time, an era of uh, massive interconnected trade, diplomacy, competing empires and empirical ambitions. Um, Obviously, this would lead to a lot of conflicts, issues, um, and some believe that it's almost like it's very similar to um, analogies that we make for globalization today, where it's like, we're going to get to this point where we're going to be overextended and it's going to just basically collapse from within. Um, So some people do believe that this was the case for the Bronze Age collapse as well. Um, There are many reasons though, for why a collapse would have happened around this period. Um, There was sort of a I don't want to say, like, basically kind of like a staling of the economy. Um, There was slowly, it was almost like a a stagnation, a little bit of a recession almost. And it it did result in a little bit of desperation on the parts of um, powers and tribes that weren't as solidified and weren't as, like, you know. Well, especially ones uh, on islands and things like that. Island nations Mm -hmm. that were, you know, they relied on sea trade only. Totally. Um, So that made you very vulnerable. Yeah. Yes, and so that's kind of one of the main reasons why people think that the Sea Peoples could have been so successful as well. So this began in about um, 1200, so yeah, 1278 BC, uh, as the records go, to about 1176. And this was a a spread out period of attacks. Like, we say about 50 years is actually more like 100 years, Mm -hmm. um, but they weren't like it wasn't like wing bang boom like they're just like constant attack like no. world war 2 all the in time waves exactly waves that's important so basically the story surrounding the sea peoples uh, begins with this epic collapse of like the 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 greeks the egyptians were starting to get a little overextended perhaps the hittites minoans and canaanites so what truly makes this mystery of the sea people so fascinating is that new evidence keeps surfacing and there is so many varied descriptions of almost like, like you said, waves of pirates and waves of these different factions. And they were constantly shifting and it made their true identity very muddied. Yes. And it made the leadership of this sort of pirate a confederacy a, a mystery. No yeah. one knew who was commanding these people and why they were there and where they came from. Right. So those are the main reasons. Who, what, and where. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. And we still don't know. This is widely debated. There are so many different theories among scholars today. Yeah. Um, all we know is that these people were fierce. They, they were, were warriors and they were intensely organized. Yeah. They were professional. Absolutely. Mm-hmm. They were definitely professional armies or made up of professional mercenaries along with other groups and stuff like that. Yeah, it is, it's absolutely bizarre. And just to reiterate again, just to, just to really hammer this home, the reason this is so insane is that these are waves of attacks on, I just want to really hit this home, the biggest empires in the world, Mm -hmm. like no one empires in the world, especially in that region of the world. Right. So this is a random band of pirates of seafaring (laughs) tribes combining together and Simple. over and overcoming the largest armies in the world in the most simplest ways because the tactics that we'll get into that they used were just that they didn't comply with the more elite style of um, offensives that were mostly used by these empires at the time. So it was kind of a revolutionary way of engaging in almost like not guerrilla warfare, but different style of warfare. Yeah, definitely a different mm-hmm. style of warfare, and you know. That, I, th- I guess that's maybe one of the things we'll get to that in the theory section, like the inability to change your tactics was maybe a reason why some of these empires fell. Mm-hmm. But when you're just thinking of the sheer size of them is what's so surprising, right? A right. band of pirates coming from the sea cannot ma- possibly be the same size of the military forces of these massive empires. It's like a yeah. 300 type situation here, except think, on the yeah. reverse side. <laughs> you know what I mean? Mm-hmm. Um, so... Yeah, we've got, like you said, the, the, the Canaanites sort of slowly disappear. The Minoans, who are the earliest European civilization to have writing and advanced technology and also are known as possibly being the Atlanteans, mm-hmm. they are wiped out. Mm-hmm. Um, the Egyptians are the only ones who managed to kind of limp their way through this, at least the first set of waves of incursions. Mm-hmm. And they're receiving letters and uh, letters from other kings and other tribal groups further to the north, hearing about these people coming towards them, which is kind of crazy. But it's essentially, the, the Egyptians become weakened to the point of near destruction as well. Mm-hmm. But they do survive. It's interesting, too, because the Egyptians suffered these waves of attacks under two different um, emperors. Right. And 
I think that's fascinating, right? That just, again, adds to the sense of longevity of like, and persistence too. Yeah. Makes you think that these people really had nothing to go back to. Yeah. If they're just there, plundering, pillaging. Some of them seem to be settling. There was evidence of, say, women and children at some points. Yeah. But mostly these very austere mercenaries um, mercenary type warriors yeah and it's interesting too because like you said right egyptians started to get little tidbits down the way of these attacks happening in different locations across the mediterranean yeah. so that kind of helps figure out for because this is a historical mystery where they came from they don't know if um the attacks actually started from the northeast and kind of flooded in um and went west or if they started in sort of the the west and just kind of like spread like a wave over top. Right. The way we saw it laid out in one documentary that does make a lot of sense if you do want to um, sort of uh, center the idea on the idea that the Egyptians were last to yeah. be attacked. Right. So essentially they said that the Mycenaeans would have been first. Uh, the attack would have come from the west. It would have swept through and knocked out the Greek, that um, peninsula, the, uh, what's it called? The... <laughs> Uh, the Peloponnesian Peninsula. Boom. Okay. <laughs> Good to know your Harati Dadi once in a while. There you right? go. That's right. Um, or am I thinking Harados? Yeah, I am thinking Harados. Um, anyways, yeah. So the Mycenaeans would have been first. Minoans, because they're right in that area too. And then it would have swept um, eastward towards the Hittite Empire, wiped them out down south. So around the bowl of the Mediterranean Sea. Got the Canaanites. There was one clue that was actually left that does support this um, particular hypothesis of direction of attack. Mm -hmm. And that was a tablet discovered in Ugarit. Right. Yes. Very so cool. this is interesting. Ugarit is um, a part of now nowadays Syria. So yeah. it's in between the Hittite and Egyptian empires. And it lies about six miles north of the Syrian port of Lakatia on the Mediterranean coast. Okay. So there are ruins um, that evidence that this was an actual city. It wasn't uncovered until quite recently, I believe in the last couple hundred years kind of okay. thing. But um, yeah, it lies about a half a mile from the shore. It's um, interesting. It was a very uh, strategic spot for trade. But essentially there was this tablet and it was uncovered and it detailed the destruction to come of these sea peoples. And it was, um, it was interpreted by many like scholars and researchers that had uncovered it as a warning message to be sent further south towards Egypt right, okay. was the idea. So that, again, supports the, the sort of um, west to east to south sweep of attack. Okay, yeah, yeah, yeah. If that makes sense. Yeah, and we are going to have maps. Um, I'm definitely going to include that in the, in the resources section just to websites that are most helpful for us and then also in the blog once we release it definitely. too. Just so people can get a... The original story goes that the tablet with this warning message was actually discovered still sitting in the kiln where right. it was going to be fired, but I don't know, like, I guess it hadn't been. And it was just waiting there, never made it out. So as you, as everyone knows, none of this was sent forward. Therefore, <laughs> there wasn't a lot for the Egyptians to kind of... Um, you know, that's, uh, a, that's ominous, right? Like you find well, this, there's a message waiting to be fired. And what's the reason it never made it out? Because, because there's the attack this was so swift. Exactly. Um, there has been some research after the fact um, saying that it's possible that it was actually just appeared to be in a kiln, that it was underneath a basket that oh. had deteriorated over top of the tablets. And it looked as if it was in some sort of a, an ancient kiln, but it, it's possible that it just fell out of a basket and oh. it had been fired. But either way, it never made it to where it was supposed to go, right? Yeah. Um, but it's interesting, too, because actually this tablet was one of many things found. And there were letters of this period preserved at the same city of Ugaret. And it does reveal, quote unquote, a city suffering from raids by pirates. Interesting. Mm. And one of these groups, which is named, um, is called the Shakala can be connected to the Sea Peoples because the same name of the same tribe appears in contemporary um, Egyptian inscriptions right. of these looting vandals, these uh, mercenary-type pirates. Just that description, right? Doesn't that just sound very Viking-esque or, yeah, very like, uh, yeah, like pirates, but pirates from the era we know of pirates, like in the, yeah. the, the 16, 16 and 1700s, right? Swashbuckling. Yeah, where they're Shitty raiding nannies. villages and they're just coming in and, you know, <laughs> killing women and children and taking what they want. The uh, the Anne Bonnies and Mary Reeds of the world. Very much so. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. 
<laughs> but again, right? Yeah. So the the tablet never made it. Message was never sent, and the the inscription was very it was vague, right? But you yeah. do get that one inkling that connects it back to the Sea People inscriptions right. of the Egyptian record. Yeah, which is basically the sole record that we rely on for the Sea Peoples. That's just it. Mm-hmm. It's yeah, some of yeah, basically the only records are coming out of the ancient out of ancient Egyptian tombs and pretty much documented exclusively by Ramses the second and Ramses the third. Mm-hmm. Um, they were the only empire to truly survive these attacks, although you could argue that, and many historians do, that they didn't really survive. Um, mm-hmm. Because, you know, shortly after this, we see, well, not shortly after, <laughs> shortly after in the massive window that is human history, but <laughs> a few hundred years go by, and mm-hmm. then sure enough, uh, the, the Persians and Greeks are really in control of the region, and right. the, the Egyptians fall off from their pedestal, basically, <gasps> right? And that's where we get uh, the story of... Uh... Of uh, a Cambyses. That's right. Taking over Egypt. Eventually, Boom. yeah. Eventually, absolutely. <laughs> that's a lot later, though. That's like almost a thousand that's like years a later. <laughs> which is insane to think, right? <laughs> that is insane. Like, that's a thousand years later from what we're talking about, and that was over 2,500 years ago from where we're sitting today. Can right? we just talk about what I... <laughs> the other day, when we were trying to fathom this, because like all you people listening back at home, if you're anything like me, it's really hard to put into context, like even, like, you know, like, okay, from sitting here at this point in the present day to the beginning of the Industrial Revolution in 1800, that seems like a buttload of time to me. And that's not. (laughs) That's like a blink of the eye. But it's funny, right? Because as you get further down the line towards classic history and like that high golden age of the Bronze Age and the Iron Age and all the stuff, I see it, it's almost like an accordion where that end is really scrunched together and it seems really close. And then everything that sort of becomes more and more present and more modern is stretched out for me. And I know that a lot of people are probably feeling like if you're, yeah, like I said, if you're anything like me, it is just hard to fathom. Totally. But just take a minute. (laughs) Well, that's why we're so fascinated in all of this stuff, right? Well, exactly, yeah. The abilities of of people so such a long time ago and just like the idea of what could have happened. Mm -hmm. How could these pirates have banded together? Because we really don't know, we don't, we don't really know the order of attacks. No. You gave a rough idea. Of what could have. And we do know that the Egyptians weren't first. Right. They couldn't have been first. But they were conveniently in the south. They were far away from a lot of other populations. Like, sure, maybe from Africa there could have been, like, I just don't think there would have been any kingdom strong enough to actually take on the Egyptians. But if even if it was from the, the west or the east, right, like the Egyptians wouldn't have been first. So No. <laughs> right. But what we do get from the Egyptians though is they identified nine factions of sea peoples that came in successive waves, but they were all working together in some sort of a coalition coming from beyond the seas. Hmm. Where they were from, we do not know. The only thing that the Egyptians stated was that they came from the north. Right. Seas from the north. The problem with that is Every single empire we've stated, other than the Canaanites, who are mm. sort of lateral to the Egyptians, are north of Egypt. Yeah. So everyone is northern. You know, some people take that as being like, it's the Norse. It's the mm. Vikings coming from the north. It's like, well, no, it could have been the Mycenaean Greeks. It could have been tribal factions from all kinds of northern. Could have been from perhaps maybe the Cumulus tribes up in uh, mainland Europe. Even though that's a stretch. <laughs> Could have been. Some scholars we'll do that. point to south, southeastern Turkey as the origin of the first wave of sea peoples, but others argue that western central Mediterranean is more likely. So Sicily, Sardinia, some of the hmm. these islands where tribal kingdoms would have existed. And in times of scarcity, tribal kings are the ones who are going to rise up, band together. The question is, how, how was that able that's to actually, overcome these empires? That's interesting, actually, because... If you think about it, yeah, that makes a lot of sense. These islander, like, smaller kingdoms. We're kind of getting ahead of ourselves right now. But okay. the idea that they would have been familiar with the classical uh, warfare tactics imposed by these um, empires. And they would have had ways to combat that by using none other than runners. runners. Which are the badasses of the ancient war realm and i love these guys this is one of my favorite theories but i'm not actually gonna get into the theory part of it right yet okay um but essentially what we want to talk about here was the fighting styles and the style of warfare at this time and a lot of this was done there was two classes there was an elite class of warrior and then there was the foot soldier so the elites were always in chariots um they were driven by horses they were up elevated above the masses and would basically just kind of charge in and do their thing and the runners 
the ground soldiers, the foot guys, would have to go and clean up the mess and actually finish like, people off. Finish right? them off. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. So obviously, yeah, we get this social stratification within the military. There's a higher class. And then I think this could have resulted in some sort of... I don't even know, like maybe perhaps a little bit of a revolution. But anyways, I'm not going to into that right now. Okay. But essentially, yeah, like we get into the sea peoples were armored in much the same way as um, these mercenary foot soldiers that were employed by empires like the Egyptians, like the Hittites, like all of these sort of Mediterranean powers. Yeah. Um, yeah. So like, a, yeah, I, I, yeah, I'm not going to get into it right now because we're on theories. I feel like we should have just get into theories. <laughs> no, that's okay. Well, I, here, let me, let me make this point too, while you're on the topic of what, the, yeah, like their weapons and stuff like that. Yeah. It's, it's important to mention that in these first waves that the Egyptians describe is that they had round shields with leather mm-hmm. covering them, which was not the same as the Egyptians. They used short javelin like spears. Or which sphinc- were or sphincters. <laughs> I mean, short javelin sphincters. <laughs> Skimiters, which is like that like um, Arab looking sword. Totally. Thing. And these were also not used by the Egyptians or people they were familiar with. Huh. And there's also descriptions of horned helmets. And long beards. And long beards. And we do know that some other Aegean groups had horned helmets. Mm-hmm. But also we know that that sounds distinctly northern. Kind of does. Anyway, continue. Hmm. Well, that was just my one main point there, because we did want to cover that, right? Um, The fact that these sea peoples were on foot made them so much more effective. They were just wiping out these chariots. As soon as you injure a horse, the chariot's wrecked, right? Right. Like, you can't can't really recover from that. You don't have an extra spare horse, not like a spare tire. No. But, uh, yeah, so essentially they they were very effective. They were. They were brutal. And like we said, right, they were obviously trained. They were effective together. That's the key. That that is the most curious part. They were trained. Mm Mm-hmm. Trained by who? By who, when, where, and how were they able to coordinate? That's the thing. What is the nucleus of this confederation? Because there has to be yeah. someone who's kicked this all off. Mm-hmm. Because the, because it is coming in successive waves. They are working together. And they're not settling the places they destroy. They destroy stuff. They create a power vacuum. And then they leave. And they come back again later. Yeah. It's, Again, that sounds very Viking-esque, right? It? Because it's, yeah, exactly that. It would have been pillaging, looting, and then continuing on. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And just... Not to say that we are saying that it is the Norse. No, we're not saying that. No. We'll, we'll talk about that in the theory section. But just, again, and, the, and the short spears is really unique because those were exclusively known for hunting. They weren't used in any armies of any of these empires. Oh, that's very at true, all. yeah. Those were only used for hunting, peasant class, basic defense. They were not weaponry used in these massive armies. No. Whose idea was that? Did right. that just happen out of necessity? Was it fluke because they just realized how effective it was especially if you are um, up against horses and stuff like that and yeah you just jam them up and but yeah because yeah because they had the chariots which and they had their archers in the chariots and archers are only effective from a distance right you're not going to have archers they're useless at it on short range yeah so yeah they discovered really quickly that these sea peoples were don't tell that to uh legolas over there (laughs) (laughs) well okay yeah fair enough (laughs) yeah so yeah, we know about these waves, like mm-hmm. I said, because of the Egyptians, but most exclusively because of excavations of two temples, that of Ramses II and Ramses III. So the te- the final resting place of Ramses III is known as the Medinet Habu. And this... Actually, wait, sorry. I'm getting ahead of myself here. Let me touch on Ramses II first. Okay. Ramses II was known as Ramses the Great, which is such a great name. It's just, I like it's just like... Uh, Oh, Cyrus the Great, mm. uh, the, the father of Cambyses and all this kind of Frederick stuff. Frederick right? the Great. Frederick the Great, Alexander the Great. And he he actually was, though, Ramses. There's too many he, was, he was legit. One of the most effective rulers in the history of ancient Egypt. Um, and we know this because of the accomplishments that he documented. He secured the borders against uh, invasions by other nomadic tribes. And he did have some success against the Sea People. Mm. Basically, in his account, the Sea Peoples are mentioned as, this is interesting, allies of the Hittites. Ooh. Now... They don't, I don't think he exclusively says the sea peoples, but potentially it was referring to the Shekelesh or one of the tribal factions linked to the sea peoples that apparently are linked to the Hittites and serving as mercenaries for them, which is fascinating. That is interesting. Um, That's a juicy accusation. Pretty much. So they're blaming the Hittites for all of this. Yeah. (laughs) That's cool. Because one of the main theories we were going to get into is that perhaps... 
these peoples came from adjacent kingdoms that were not controlled by the Hittites, but were on the same um, sort of peninsula. Right, exactly. Mm -hmm. So all of this comes from the inscription on the Merintaf. So it's it's the burial temple of Ramses II. It basically says that the Libyans attempted to invade the Nile Delta. It writes how in the fifth year of his reign in 1209 BC, there's a chief of the Libyans that was allied with the Sea Peoples. Hmm. So there's another juicy tidbit there. Hmm. He refers to the Libyan allies as coming, quote, from the seas to the north, which we just said before could be a a lot of different places. The names of these territories, as he he names them as the Echoesh, the Teresh, the Luca, the Sheridan, and like I just said, the Shekelesh tribes. Mm -hmm. Mm Mm-hmm. Scholars have since sort of tried to identify these, but we do not know exactly where they're from. Yeah. And a lot of people will try and do, like, equate um, parallels with, like, say, the Shackalash were the Sardinians. And, like, there might be some evidence to support that, but a lot of it is very loose. It's also just relying on our, like, modern interpretation of, like, the phonetics. You know what I mean? Like, basically saying this is similar to that, so they must have been referring to the Sardinians because it sounds similar. Exactly. That's sort of, uh, it can get to be a little sticky there. Well, exactly. And a little bit too convenient, perhaps, too. Yeah. Mm Mm-hmm. Even more interesting, though, than the documentations from Ramses II, it comms from his successor, Ramses III. And there is a crazy... um, seen on the side of the Medinet Habu depicting um, prisoners of the Philistines. And we'll talk about that um, a little later in the episode. Mm -hmm. But this is so cool. Um, It's basically a series of hieroglyphics describing his achievements against the Sea Peoples and also their achievements against Egypt, like what they were capable of doing. Okay. This is one of the um, quotes from... uh, from the Medina Tabu, it basically reads, it translates as, I established my boundary in Dahi, pre- prepared in front of them the local princes, garrison commanders, and Marainu. I uh, caused to be prepared the river mouth like a strong wall with warships, galleys, and skiffs. Mm. They were comp- completely equipped with both fore and aft with brave fighters carrying their weapons and infantry of all the pick of Egypt, being like roaring lions upon the mountains. The chariotry were able warriors and all goodly officers whose hands were competent. Their horses quivered in their limbs, prepared to crush the foreign countries under their hooves. (laughs) So it's all very dramatic, right? Very cool. So (laughs) he prepared. That's really cool. So So he he had the warships ready to go. Yeah. He he was the only one that met them at sea. And that's it. Mm -hmm. And that was the big linchpin of their success. Yeah. A lot of people believe because they were able to use fire and archery, and basically just firebomb the ships. Let's just point out the massive irony of that. The sea peoples (laughs) are not good at fighting on the water. (laughs) They're not true pirates. They come from the sea, but they are land fighters. They are, they are, they are grit, they're grit and grind. They're like the Memphis Grizzlies of the, of the Bronze Age. They're just like spears and work. It's a true testament to how important the seas were for travel at that time. And, uh, it wasn't just the seas, there were the rivers as well, uh, and that could have connected all of mainland Europe, even up to, like, the UK, which it actually did, and uh, there's definitely proof of that, and we're going to get into the whole, like, yeah, Bronze Age trade routes and how that could possibly be connected back to the Sea Peoples, but yeah, like you said, he was one of the few successes Ramses the third. Boom, he's a boss, man. He was, yeah, he was legit, and the coolest name, too, of, mm-hmm. like, most Egyptian pharaohs, I'll just say. Mm-hmm. In my opinion. <laughs> <laughs> but it's interesting, though, because even he wasn't... It wasn't infallible. Like, he had some great ideas, and he did meet them on the sea, which is great. But they just came back. They would come back again and again and again. And it was kind of annoying. It's like he, he defeats them. <laughs> he defeats it's them. Of, it's kind of annoying. He wrote, man. the sea peoples were getting pretty annoying. <laughs> <laughs> they were. It's like, come on, man. You defeat them in, in 1207, and they come back in 1180, and you're just like, God. <laughs> well, that's the thing that's so that I find bizarre too because it's like okay if you're <laughs> because they had success the first two times against in, in battles against Ramses back. the second was like if you're if you're running away from a place that's desolate famine drought things like that or mm. bad trade why wouldn't you stay like I don't know like what, what are you gaining well, they, by just 
taken some food and then you, you kill some people and then you're back to the same place. Like, where are you going that back to? Because where you speak to a few different things. Maybe they don't have the um, political organization that they have with their military, right? So they don't have a way of actually governing over these places. And then you could also be of the mind that if these are like a 300, like where they're a minority, yeah. do you really want to, um, like... Satch, uh, like you know like get yourself settled in a place where potentially there are bigger more powerful political factions that can just come and overthrow you right where you like is it just better I, to keep actually, them weak keep I, them down and just keep knocking well, them down well it's kind of it's actually that kind of makes sense right it's like mm-hmm. if these if they're successful because they are loose groups of mercenaries and things like that then yeah you're gonna have a real hard time all of a sudden being like okay we're here let's have a centralized government yeah and somebody Who's to control taxes mm-hmm. and food and that it's like, like no, screw yeah, that. Okay. That's probably that. more burden than they would want. Right. They're just there for probably very specific reasons for supplies, for food, and for weapons, probably. And that's about that. Hmm. I don't know. I, I, but, and to instill terror. That's just it, though. It's like, <laughs> you wonder if they were given some sort of, like, a Garden of Eden type message or something. Not, not like, not, not that they're searching for Ooh. an end. Th- or, like, a Manifest Destiny type something thing. Something like that, where it's like, you know... You're you're struggling, so go you know take these empires and make your way, and eventually it will. I don't even know. You know what I mean? Mm-hmm. Like who, who? Like the Exodus, like some sort of the organization behind it implies that there's a greater purpose than just yeah. you're running away because you're hungry. Maybe they were searching for the Holy Grail. No, I'm kidding. <laughs> Not quite there yet. <laughs> <laughs> <It's literally. laughs> like twelve hundred years away. Actually, more than that. Like. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, a lot further down the way. Which, again, speaks to the accordion-like scenario that is my visual in my head of this history. But anyways. Yeah. You've got an interesting quote here about some of the damage that they did. Yes, I will read this out because this was from Ramses III, and it's quite interesting. So he says here, quote, <clears throat> The Sea Peoples attacked and destroyed the Egyptian trading center at Kadesh, and then again attempted an invasion of Egypt. They began their activities with quick raids along the coast, as they had done in the time of Ramses II, I before <laughs> driving for the Delta. Oh, sorry. Um, Ramses III defeated them in 1180 BCE, but they returned in force. Yeah. In his own victory inscription, Ramses III describes the invasion. And actually, that was the quote that I just read previously. Oh, okay, cool. Um, So So when he's talking about establishing his boundaries, how he has the river mouth strong wall with warships, galleys. Yeah, so he basically, he he was prepped. He was the one that was prepped and ready to go. Yeah, well, yeah, if you've inherited this struggle from your predecessor, then yeah, you better have something, some good ideas. (laughs) Yeah, your people are going to be pretty chapped if you don't. And like we said, right, there were evidence of other things going on, like perhaps drought, famine, um, earthquakes, earthquakes, all this kind of stuff. So there was a lot of instability happening, Absolutely. not just as a result of the Sea Peoples. No, they, mm. they could have just been the cherry on top. Um, in a, in oh, a and sea- other, yeah, political reasons yeah. too. Mm-hmm. Absolutely, a cherry on top of just perfect, the perfect storm, so mm-hmm. to speak. Mm-hmm. Almost like it was meant to be mm. um, the Bronze Age coming to an end. You know what I mean? Mm. But, like I said, could this timing have been absolutely perfect? Was it just that these, you know, it couldn't have just been that these sea, that these, that the sea peoples were just the greatest warriors ever and no. just had figured out how to defeat these massive armies? No, they had things aiding them. They got lucky. Mm-hmm. They got lucky. They got there at the right time. Yeah. Um, and one of the reasons that their timing could have been perfect is because of the Battle of Kadesh that mm-hmm. took place in 1274 BCE and that was led on the Egyptian side by Ramses II. And this was a massive battle between the Egyptians and the Hittites, who okay. were definitely, like, major enemies. Like, they were exactly. even more so enemies than, like, the Israelites and the Philistines, almost. And like, they're neighboring, right? Yeah. So that, again, um, your border's encroaching on my borders, your resources are encroaching on my resources, exactly. I don't like you very much. So you gotta wonder if maybe the news of how this battle ended up leaked out to factions that would have initiated the Sea People's incursions? Possibly, because in 1274 BC, the Hittites, led by King Muatali, who ruled from from 1295 to 1272, invaded the city of Kadesh and took on the Egyptians, led by Ramses II. So they faced each other. I don't know exactly how long this battle lasted for, Hmm. but... Both sides were extremely decimated. And just to give you a geographical location, if you look on the map, this is basically Kadesh is located on the 
Oratonis River on the border of modern Syria and Lebanon. Okay. So in within that area there. Mm-hmm. What's really interesting about this battle, though, is that it was the first recorded history um, that de- actually depicted chariots as a major part of warfare, even oh. though we knew that they had been mm-hmm. in the past. This is where they really jazzed it up and were like, look at our chariots. They're <laughs> awesome. Um, no, really. Golden because chariots. They're, yeah, because the... the, the, the uh, um, the inscriptions of them on the walls of things found, it's like, they're massive. It's like a 50 foot tall, like chariot right. thing, but, but they actually weren't very effective. No. <laughs> Shortly after all the sea people stuff, chariots would end up only really being used for reconnaissance and flanking and things like that. Well, that's just, yeah. <laughs> reconnaissance I could see for sure, because like, it's so awkward, right? It's almost just designed to protect the inhabitant and just to kind of like, it's almost like someone with like a, a beater that's just going to go into like a, a monster truck rally or something yeah. and be like, boom, I'm just going to, but I'm protected because I've got the cage around me. Right. But I don't know. Yeah. Man, chariots, man. Yeah, chariots. And then once you break an axle, then you're done. Oh, you're toast. What do you do? You, well, you, you have to abandon it. You do. In the middle of the battlefield? Like, what? Do you, what? Time out, guys. <laughs> Time out, guys. <laughs> yeah. What's even more curious about this battle, though, is we don't know who won. Um, <laughs> both sides claim victory. Um, Both sides were decimated from it. There has been a recently discovered um, tablets in Turkey that were documenting spoils of war coming from on the Hittite side, Mm -hmm. um, that they were receiving spoils of war from the Egyptians, indicating that they were the ones who probably tipped tipped in favor of the Hittites in that battle. Okay. But... Of course, Egyptians, Ramses claimed it. Uh, He claimed that he cast them into the river like crocodiles and he slew whomever he desired. Uh, (laughs) While the Hittite version reads, at the time of the king, Molotali made war against the king of Egypt when he defeated the king of Egypt. Ah. So not very descriptive on the Hittite side, but uh, um, that's what they said. So, (laughs) yeah. And of course, um, this would have left both sides weakened, ready for the already warmed up sea peoples Mm -hmm. who had been traveling around, potentially gathering more mercenaries as they went, battling Mycenaean Greeks and things like that. Okay. Ready to come down and take on the largest of them all, really, which was Egypt. Yeah, that's very true. So just to reiterate, um, this battle, the Battle of Kadesh, ultimately resulted, or Kadesh, um, it resulted in what is known as the Great Peace, which lasted over 50 years. It was a pact signed by the Hittites and the Egyptians. Yeah. And it basically put a lot of mercenaries out of work. Right. Hmm. Mm. Which some people think that that could have um, been a, a major reason for the incursions of these sea peoples. Maybe they were the mercenaries. We don't know. Um, but yeah. I okay. mean, yeah. So, a bit, so maybe they were. But essentially, what we have here is that, <laughs> just to reiterate again, seafaring pirate confederacy takes advantage of possibly weakened Hittites and Egyptians, already weakened by trade and e-commerce Mycenaeans and Minoans, Mm -hmm. and slaughters these people and creates a power vacuum. Yeah. Because they don't settle. That is the key thing. Creates a power vacuum and creates a massive disruption in the coastal habits of a lot of these populations. And some of the best evidence we have of this type of destruction and this like almost like massive migrations away from the coastlines is um, on the evident or sorry, the island of Crete and it's called Mount Carfi. Uh, There was a Polish archeologist in um, the 18, sorry, in the 1980s. His name was Krzysztof Nowitzki. And he actually um, mapped and reconstructed uh, an extremely high up mountain fortress, essentially. Yeah. Uh, It was approximately 1100 meters above sea level and was definitively not of the patterns previously seen where people it was easy right of course you would be around the coast you have water you have food you have trade resources you travel all this kind of stuff doesn't make any sense why anyone would want to be at the top of this really desolate really hard um terrain to um negotiate especially if you have um, pack animals anything like that or cargo whatever definitely so um, the only reason you'd be up there is if you're hiding from something, if you're trying to secure yourself. And so basically, yeah, he uncovered these ma- like it wasn't massive, but it was um, significant settlements of yeah. large um, communities, right? Definitely. So essentially, yeah, there were huge blocks of stone that suggest permanent settlement, not a temporary one as suggested by previous scholars. 
Um, but essentially, yeah, it, it is really an extremely difficult place to get to. There's almost like an invisible trail along the side of one of the like jagged mountain faces. It's like just like a sheer cliff of yeah. rock. And essentially you can take your pack animals up there one at a time, like, you know, and it's very it's precarious. You can't even see it from the bottom, right? It's meant to be invisible. It's meant to protect is the idea. Yeah. And it's not the most loveliest place to live in. Uh, in the winter, it could be a little bit cold, a little bit windy. Don't tell really, that. really windy. Don't and tell cold. that to the Inuit, though. Yeah. <laughs> so I feel like they would get insulted. <laughs> well, from the Mediterranean, though, this was a place where people wouldn't have been living. Very true. Would yes. not have been living. Exactly. The only reason for you to be there is to be running away from something, mm -hmm. and that is exactly what we see at the end. We when at the end of the Bronze Age when we. The Egyptian records end. We know that the Sea Peoples were there. We we get into the, the Dark Ages. Mm -hmm. People stop writing stuff down. People forget how to do things. Mm -hmm. And they flee. We see mass, yes. mass migration. So this is kind of the evidence of one, of one, one particular case on the island of Crete. So essentially, excavation of this site revealed around 20 to 30 buildings. Um, it could have housed approximately 600 to 1,200 people. They said approximately 300 families, so that's multiple that's, members. Yeah, decent and size. It does date to the correct time. So this is right around 1200 BC. So right when the Aegean um, apocalypse was happening and all of these sea people's incursions were... Um, happening as well definitely and so the main question obviously is what what is the meaning of this why did these people do this like was it for protection was it for was it like some sort of like mountain temple but no it wasn't that no um and then other people say like oh it wasn't the sea peoples it was um drought and earthquake that made them go up there okay first of all i feel like the farther you get up in on Crete, like we saw from the documentary footage, you're not getting fresh water sources from there. Like, no. it doesn't make any sense. And then earthquakes? Why are you going higher? You're going <laughs> like, to a is... much more precarious location. <laughs> exactly. From earthquakes. So it doesn't really make sense. The only thing that really makes sense is that there were these incursions of raiders that had made people have to pick up and leave, which is very sad. That but... their empires weren't able to protect them from. Exactly. Exactly. Right. Yeah. Um, the thing that Christoph Nowitzki makes a point of too is that the that this small small village, the small town or whatever, mm -hmm. would have been it, it survived because it would have had a very small class of warriors of its own. So like the it would have been the Mycenaeans, okay. Mycenaean warriors, mm -hmm. and yeah, they like they very much like three hundred lad like channeled it so that it was almost impossible to get to except for going like one by one. The entire backside of the settlement was completely exposed. So the entire backside of it facing the inward, in, in, inland, mm -hmm. they were not afraid of anybody coming from there. Okay. They did, they, and there were others. There were other tribes. There were people on the island. Mm -hmm. They were not afraid. They were, they were worried about what was coming from the sea. Right. The sea people. Yeah. And I would be too. <laughs> yeah, no kidding. That's very interesting. So yeah, it, it definitely shows that it was a human threat, not nature, that these people were running from. Yeah. And he found more evidence of this too. So the same archaeologist, Christoph, Christoph Nowitzki, found evidence on Mount Kalamata. So settlements as well as pottery. And they all dated to the same same period and located in the same types of precarious locations that nobody would go to unless you're running away from something. This was then reconfirmed in the 90s, uh, 1990s, by an American archaeologist named Donald Haggis, okay. who accompanied uh, Nowitzki to, the, to his, the first site on Crete in order to get a better idea of this and give his opinions on this high mountain pass village, basically. Mm -hmm. <laughs> he described it as basically like, you had to scale a cliff face using footholes carved into the rock, man-made footholes, oh. so specifically hidden away. The mm -hmm. crops and the areas for livestock were located kilometers below mm. so you had to sneak down to your crops and livestock and you were more willing for them to be slaughtered or taken or right. stolen keep them far away from you well, there's a reason well, that's the only that. way there it would have been like because there was just like a basic just like bare rock yeah it was like bedstone like or bedrock bed, bedstone. <laughs> the stone of the bed, the bed. okay <laughs> yeah <laughs> <laughs> and of course, what it had was great visibility, right? So it has a vantage point. You can see who's attacking. Yes. That's the main, that's another main part of this. So they deal. would have had hours to prepare if they did see something coming along. Yeah. Mm -hmm. All in all, over 80 sites across the island of Crete alone were 
where he, Nowitzki discovered were places of refuge and dating to the Bronze Age collapse. People hiding from the coast. Interesting. Hiding from the sea peoples. Absolutely bizarre. I love that. And that's, yeah, like we said, that's the best evidence we have of the the fleeing and of the attempts to evade these possible pirates. Yeah. Before we get into theories, though, we're going to take a quick promo break for a really cool podcast that we've just started to get into. It is called Relic Podcast, and host Maxwell uh, takes us on a journey digging under the couch cushions of history, looking (laughs) for treasures and relics that have been misplaced by time. So very uh, much interested in the same sort of things we are. So take a listen to this promo and check out Relic Podcast. Who stole some of history's most famous paintings from the Isabella Stewart Gardner Museum? Where is the lost Dutchman's mine, and how come so many people who go looking for it never seem to come back? Relic, the Lost Treasure podcast's second season, investigates the mysteries behind unsolved artifact crimes and goes in search of lost treasures with very sinister reputations. You can catch all of season one now on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, and most streaming platforms. New episodes release every other Wednesday of the month at 8 a.m. Eastern Standard Time. You can also follow me, Maxwell, on Twitter at Lost Treasure Pod. The adventure continues. And we're back. So make sure you guys go check out Relic Podcast. Yeah. So now we're getting into some theories. And there's a few points that I wanted to make just to keep in mind um, that we've mentioned so far. The ideas of drought, famine, obviously wars, um, like the Battle of Kadesh, Mm -hmm. weather, that being earthquakes, volcanic activity, and things like that. Mm -hmm. And then obviously the paranormal, if you want to chuck that in there on the end. (laughs) (laughs) That was in the notes. (laughs) Didn't add it in there, but we're a paranormal show, so... (laughs) I said Poseidon was going to come in here at some point. Maybe there was the god of the seas that rose up and led the sea peoples to an incursion on the Egyptians. I believe it already. Sorry, that's my opinion. (laughs) Um, But yeah, no, definitely lack of food and water is a possibility leading to mass migrations of people and, yeah, banding together of mercenaries and things like that. And during this people, we do know that... um, Ramses II wrote that there were women and children that were part of the caravans linked to these sea people. Mm-hmm. So that indicates fleeing populations, not just yeah. mercenaries and warriors. You know, the thing that I kind of had in my head when I heard that was like, okay, so you see these people, you see women, you see children, and you see these warriors. Do you see them all together? Or perhaps there are families that are fleeing lands that have been previously desolated and demolished by these people, and so they're kind of just caught in the middle of all this stuff happening, and they're not actually a part of it, but they're just trying to make their way. Right, like they're not traveling with them. Exactly. They're just kind of there, too, because they're like, okay, I'm, I'm traveling away from destruction, so are these people, I seem to be following them, I don't know. Right. But I, I, I do like the idea, too, that there were actual uh, well, families involved. Because like the a, wealth and sustainability that was left in the region was definitely to be found in the, you know, the Nile Valley and the Levant. You know, these were the fertile areas of the right. Mediterranean. And um, so that could possibly account for one of the reasons. But my question still is, how is it that they formed together? Like, what is the central power of all of this? Mm-hmm. Um, to come back to the... Uh, drought and things like that though there is archaeological evidence of drought taken from pollen samples and other plant archaeology in the late bronze age so Mm, we know that there was massive drought of course leading to massive famine because you can't grow anything you can't water your animals we know that as a thing how much of that played a part though is to yeah again we, we don't know yeah that's that's yeah and uh, earthquakes, again, would have been a big factor, too. Could have displaced a lot of people. There is evidence in um, lots of these main cities, these strongholds of, uh, like, in the ruins today of um, exactly that, like, uh, whole walls that have been sort of, like, shooken apart, which only happens with tectonic activity. They so fall it's almost a like a snake. Way, right? Oh, true, yeah. So if you have, like, a whole bunch of columns, example, if they all fall the same direction, that can definitely point to some some Earth sort point. of seismic activity as well. And then um, there is the idea, the fact, not an idea, the fact that there are two fault lines in this zone that match up with a lot of the city locations that declined during the end of the Bronze Age and collapsed. And so, yeah, uh, these are, scholars have been roughly aligning them. They've been able to do that with the fall of these capitals. Um, 
how accurate this is to the exact year, we don't know. No. Um, but it is in the same sort of range. Isn't that a crazy idea, though? So it's like some people don't believe in the Sea Peoples at all. They, they think, like, sure, there were some battles here and there, but it's all blown out of proportion. And mm-hmm. all of these... Like you just said, they're all located on these fault lines. Yeah. They all just were because of natural disasters. Yes. That's why people fled. Very true. And people use the argument of what is called a earthquake storm. And this can actually result in uh, what you can call an unzipping of a fault line. So this occurs over a period of years, could even be decades, where um, different sections of the fault line slip and result in miniature, not miniature, because they could be quite destructive, but just like different... um, areas of uh, seismic activity and earthquakes again. So this could have almost been seen as like a, a, a domino effect. And like the, <laughs> you could almost say this is from the gods, right? Like this is some sort of divine um, sort of power that's like, you know, like. Well, yeah, like you described that in a very light way, but mm-hmm. really like earthquake storm, the unzipping of a fault line. This is a series of earthquakes that never stop over mm-hmm. potentially decades. Or they could stop and then they start up again. People could interpret that as the gods are angry with them. Maybe that's why they moved away from coastlines. I don't know. But again, why would you move to a more precarious location exactly. for earthquakes, right? Um, and the American archaeologist that accompanied Nowitzki too made the point in that documentary that um, people recover from earthquakes really quick, mm-hmm. even multiple ones, yeah. reoccurring ones. They kind of they recover very very quickly throughout history. Mm-hmm. So hmm. would they have gone right back down to the water? It sort of seems like they would have if that was the reason. Maybe they thought God was punishing them and that they needed to go to the most extreme places in order to make it stop. I don't know. <laughs> I'm not a religious person myself, so I'm not sure. You know, some people get a lot of um, martyrish ideas in their head, and they were like, "Well, we need to go suffer." I guess Let's that's possible. I don't know. Like, if you feel like the gods of the sea, like if there was a yeah. tsunami or something. Exactly, like that, right? right? Yeah, because, like, they're like, oh my goodness, Poseidon or whoever they believed in at that time or is angry with us. So. Right. I feel like that's part of it. Like, wh- how cool of an idea is it to think that, like, the, the sea peoples are just a confederation that is really in tune with the earth? And maybe there are these series of earthquakes taking place and they time it perfectly. So earthquake takes place and then sure enough, the sea people show up shortly after Mm. when a city is weak and decimated and they take what they please. I like that. That's kind of interesting. Let's touch on the tribes. Yeah. Um, Because we're we're still trying to figure it out. We will never truly know who the hell these people were. There's nine factions that made up these marauders. Mm -hmm. And the first of which was the Sheridan, um, described by the Greeks. Is that correct? The Sheridan. Uh, no, no, these were Egyptian records. So, yeah, like you said, they do mention nine tribes. There were only five that we actually got the names of. But we didn't want to get too bogged down in these specific groups. We just wanted to mention a few things that kind of um, made them unique in their own way. So it would have represented a, a, a specific wave with a specific sort of cultural sort of appearance yeah, and right. style of attack and totally. stuff like that. So, yeah, I mean, I guess, like we said already, like, some believe they may have originated in the Western Mediterranean, possibly linked to the Sardinians, but I don't know. The Sheridan, right? The Sheridan, Mm -hmm. yeah, like, because of the name, the S, right? Right. So, but I don't know, like, I'm, I don't know how satisfactory that is for me. The weaponry (laughs) and the dress they wore does have some vague similarities to the tribal factions on Sardinia, apparently. That being the round shields, um, horned helmets, and the types of swords. Oh, yeah. But others disagree with that. There's a there's a quote here from Ramses II describing the Sheridan. The unruly Sheridan, whom no one had ever known how to combat, they came boldly sailing their warships from the midst of the sea, none being able to withstand them. Ooh. That doesn't sound like a tribe from Sardinia. No. Um, that sounds like something a little more intense than that. The unruly Sheridan. Right? That no one knew how to combat. Had ever known. Ever. So does that mean they they, no one ever knew how to fight them? Or no one had ever even known of them? Right. Therefore, they don't know how to fight them. Yeah. That's crazy. An unknown compelling force. And just think about that. It's the same sort of idea of like my pre-Columbian contact fascination and sitting there and all of a sudden you have these ships coming towards you and the people on board and you have no idea who they are. What they are, who they are, where they're from, what is that ship? It's and just they're not bizarre. peaceful. And they mm. want to kill you. <laughs> yeah, that's uh, not That's very always nice. a nice cherry on top. I thought this was interesting, though, here, where it says um, the first certain mention of the Sheridan is found in yeah, Ramses II's records. And um, 
that the pharaoh had actually incorporated many of these warriors into his personal guard. The ones that they had captured. Yeah. That is interesting to me. Yeah. And that speaks to some type of cultural uniformity where they were able to be like, you know, so they're not they're not like these Vikings. crazy <laughs> Vikings that can't be tamed, that can't be negotiated with or something. These are people that have some type of reason because if they're part of the personal guard of the emperor of you know what I mean? Like well, unless that's, that's your only option. You become a mercenary for the emperor or your... Well, true. But to my mind, that kind of speaks to the idea that these could have been previous mercenaries that had gone their own way, maybe become embittered because of um, economic and financial constraints and whatever, mm -hmm. um, suffering from famine, all these things. Yeah. And then they go and do all this badass stuff with uh, taking down the, you know what I mean? Like in these waves of attacks and it's impressive, right? So he's like, okay, well, let's get you back in here. Let's yeah. get you well fed and treat you nice and hopefully be on our team now. <laughs> yeah, no, <laughs> you're, but you're sense. right though. There, had, there, there must have been some sort of like, cause if, yeah, if you're coming from across the sea, like you're, or something crazy like that, mm -hmm. then, you know, how, how you're not going to be able to communicate. They're not going to be able to exactly, do anything. Exactly. Yeah. The right? language. Like you're not going to understand anything. The language would have been huge. Yeah. I don't know. Hmm. I but guess. We, the, well, I, sorry. Go ahead. Oh no. So I was just going to move on to this, the Shekel Ash. Oh, yeah, because these people it. were quite interesting too. Mm -hmm. These were my personal favorites when we were looking through the descriptions because they're quite, again, right? Murky origins. No, no known uh, source of where they came from, no. but they had massive beards, <laughs> which is very interesting. interesting. And they wore pointed kilts. Some had tassels on them. Um, others wore large medallions on their chest. I wasn't able to ascertain whether these were bronze medallions, gold, I don't know. Others just had simple leather straps bound across their chests. And their weapon of choice was the scimitar, um, a style of dagger originating from the east, or they would carry two spears with them. So, uh, double spear. That's yeah, hardcore. Double spear them. Sweet. <laughs> Well, just like in, <laughs> it was just brought to mind <laughs> when we were watching um, Deadpool. Deadpool. Yeah. And he was like, <laughs> the How did sword. this guy just become a human kebab? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> oh, man. Yeah. Well, that makes me wonder if there's any links to, like, honestly, like, potentially, like, ancient Mongolians huh? and, like, other groups from the Northeast um, or something along those lines, too. I mean, if there's, because it's no way, because that's a weird description, right? Like, medallions on your chests. Pointed kilts, mm -hmm. massive beards. That's definitely a feature of the Mongolian hordes. But the kilts sounds Celtic, mm -hmm. but this is way predating any Celtic tribes in Europe. This oh, is like definitely. a thousand years before. For sure. Um, so that's strange. That that doesn't sound Mediterranean. You know no. what I mean? No, it doesn't sound Mediterranean, but I am not an expert in... Uh, the garb of Mediterranean warriors. So. We, well, that's just it. This episode was like, there's so much detail. We're, we just thought the story was really cool. Like, we could have an whole episode just on the weapons and, you know, defense. And, and the, the, yeah, exactly what they were wearing. There was one example um, known as the Fusta, Fusta Nella. Okay. And this was actually a traditional pleated skirt-like garment. Uh, I don't know if it was actually pointed or not, but it was referred to as a kilt, and it was more worn by men and um, most widely used in the Balkans area, so southeast Europe. Interesting. Mm -hmm. In the Balkans. Yeah. So, yeah, so there could be these kingdoms coming from way far north. Exactly. And I'm not sure how the modern Rus. this is, but apparently in Greece there is a short version of the Fustanella. Fustanella, sorry, guys. Um, that's worn, um, in ceremonial military units. Interesting. Mm -hmm. Crazy. Cool, hey? Very cool. So, kilts don't have to be Celtic. No. <laughs> well, that, no, no they, of course not, but if that, that's just automatically what 99.999 .99 people are going to think of when you hear that word, Very true. right? Um, and that's why we kind of want to, yeah, yeah, tackle that and just be like, you know what? Yeah. <laughs> um, but yeah, okay, so we have all of these tribes where... We don't have any origins for any of these guys. No. It's kind of annoying. But we do have origins for one group of people that are, I'm not even going to say, they have been sort of lumped together as what has been termed Luwian-speaking peoples right. or tribes. Right. Um, and this comes, this idea that comes from Luwian studies, and it's a research group that's headed by one Eberhard Zanger. And he actually claims that the Sea Peoples were a coalition of these Luwian-speaking peoples that joined together against a common enemy, the Hittites. 
And cool. so okay. basically these Luwian speakers were disparate, like just small tribes, kingdoms, uncontrolled by the Hittites. They were on the same peninsula. So like we said, the Anatolia Peninsula there yeah. um, in the very east. And they were also known to originate from like, like even like further um, eastward. So the Asia Minor region too. Crazy. Yes. So essentially they were all different sort of... Um, not uniform culturally, but they did have common language. And so a lot of people will take issue with um, just the ease at which this guy Zanger refers to them as one people because that's a very convenient way of referring to them. Yeah. But anyways, uh, yeah, the, the Luwians actually preceded the formation of the Hittites. There's evidence of hieroglyphic texts from these people as early as 2000 BCE. Crazy. Yeah. And this is a quote here. It says, since most Luwian hieroglyphic documents have thus far been found in early Iron Age Syria and Palestine, the term Luwian is often used to denote people at the eastern end of the Mediterranean during the 10th and 9th centuries BC, so way after the um, incursions of the Sea People. So yeah. they were around after, which some people point, use that as evidence to say that they were the Sea People. That they made it through. Exactly. Or they made it through, or they were the Sea People. Right. But then, however, this, this is another just continue on with the same quote here. It also comprises the people who lived in the Western Asia Minor during the second millennium BC. So, and they wouldn't have regarded themselves as belonging to neither one, the Hittites or the Mycenaeans. They were just in were between. Interesting. So that's interesting, right? Very so you were so. mentioning like these little island pockets and kingdoms and whatever else. These people were on the mainland. They had access to a huge amount of very valuable resources of this time so lots yeah. of metals and things like that that were used uh, in smeltering for the production of bronze Absolutely, yeah. um but yeah no it's interesting because while many nations lost writing one of the pillars of civilization during this collapse of the bronze age the luwians maintained their written language for nearly half a millennium after wow and they That's died impressive. out they died out, yeah, like somewhere, like, you know, like in the rise of uh, the Romans and the, the rise of the Persians, all that kind of stuff. So Crazy. But yeah, it's interesting. This Zanger guy, <laughs> his name is Z-A-N-G-G-E-R. He thinks that about, um, yeah, 32,000, or sorry, 100 years ago, 32,000, <laughs> 3,200 years ago, these Luwians amassed a massive war force and destroyed the Hittites. And then basically, um, this is a quote here, it says... Um, yeah, they basically um, continued their campaign for wealth and power and just headed towards the Mycenaeans, headed towards Egypt. They were like, you know, screw all you guys. They got we managed to. And they kept exactly. Going. They were like, oh, if we can take out the Hittites, then we can take out all these people, maybe. Hmm. So that's kind of his idea there. Um, I like that idea. It's interesting. interesting, to say the least, because it is these sort of um, different groups, right? Yeah. Of roughly from the same region. So they might have been able to like you said, like have those lines of connectivity of sort of like diplomacy and planning and all the stuff of these attacks. But yeah, these people weren't nobodies. They went on to form a powerful empire of their own post Sea People's Invasion and post Bronze Age Collapse. It stretched from northern Greece to Lebanon and continued on until they were destroyed by a Mycenaean king coalition at the culmination of the Trojan War in Troy. Crazy. All right. Yeah. Okay. And and this is actually referred to by Zanger as World War Zero because of its sheer intensity and because of the fact that these were like almost like a, it's like a mini globalized sort of political arena yeah. in which all of this was playing out. But yeah, the Trojan War did bring about the Sea People. So it was quite a bit before Rome. Sorry, I kind of had that wrong there. That's okay. Um, yeah. Hmm. So interesting though. Apparently there are... It has been confirmed through satellite imagery that Anatolia Peninsula was heavily populated with these Luwian speakers, and there are over 340 settlements left unexcavated that did not belong to the Hittite Empire that could have potentially been these smaller kingdoms of these people. Right. Yes. So, like I alluded to, a lot of archaeologists do consider Zanger's approach to this um, area of research bombastic to a certain extent, but at the same time, they are kind of grateful to him too because he's bringing the headlines and he's bringing the public attention and consciousness to these issues which is no doubt a positive thing for continued research in the area definitely but yeah the idea of an international world war and the idea of cultural uniformity with these Luwian civilizations is highly questionable to a lot of scholars but again right this could um could be evidence of like you know like all these different waves of different people yes 
you know, that totally. could make sense. I'm leaning that way. I like I, it. I like this guy's take on it for I sure. I like it all day. It's sort of the same kind of an idea with the Etruscans and the idea mm. that they ended up rising up as this, uh, you know, pre-Roman civilization out of um, Tuscany. Okay, on on yeah. the mainland of Italy, of modern day Italy, and that they were members of the Sea Peoples that you know survived that you know survived their own incursions of these places, mm-hmm. and then didn't necessarily settle, but stayed in the area and ended up settling the areas of Tuscany and became the Etruscans, who yeah. have the um, I can't remember which it is. They have the indecipherable linear B language. Is right. that correct? Something along those yeah. lines? So it was um, inherited from the Minoans. There was that really simplistic um, rudimentary language. Then it went to Linear A. Then it went to Linear B. Parts of Linear B have been deciphered, not all of it. And then parts of Linear A... Uh, linear A has compl- hasn't been deciphered at all. Right, okay. As far as I'm aware. Interesting. Mm-hmm. So there's no... Like, again, this is kind of a fringy idea, though, right? Because there's the... A lot of historians will just kind of point to the fact that like the Etruscans basically rose up there. They, they flourished in the sixth century. So yeah. this is way after way the Bronze after. Age collapse. They were around in the eighth century though. They too. were around. Mm-hmm. The, the question is, did they develop out of, they, they definitely out would have the developed vacuum. out of the power vacuum. Yeah. Whether or not the actual people themselves were linked to those coming from other places and became the Etruscans. We it's, don't know. It's loose. Yeah. We don't know if they're, remnants of the Minoan Empire or if they're a shit mix of people, basically. Yeah. Like, we don't really know. But they were really yeah. advanced, and we know that they kept records of basically nothing except for their e-commerce, which is fascinating. True, um, yeah. And e- e-commerce? <laughs> Commerce, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> no internet. These guys were just setting up Shopify stores all over the place. <laughs> Man, I am so used to dealing with our stuff, I'm just like... <laughs> yeah, no, but they... I, I don't think that theory has any weight, to be honest. The you're Etruscan? I like the idea that, like you said, they came out of the power vacuum, that they rose up. Potentially their um, long-lost descendants could have been um, remnants of people attacked by sea peoples or the sea peoples themselves. That's where it gets muddy. Yeah. The um, one cool thing about them, though, I should point out, we wrote down here, yeah. the idea that they were very much like the Minoans and not like the Mycenaeans and other cultures. They were more progressive. Yeah. So women socially. And socially progressive. Mm-hmm. And that was one of the reasons why the Minoans were potentially the uh the peoples of the of atlantis right um believed to be right advanced in social social event advances exactly. and technological advances very egalitarian yeah um yeah one other point i wanted to make on the note of the etruscans though was that they were lords of the seas until they disappeared in history like yeah. they had massive trade routes they were known for their wine in particular huge exports of all these amphoras there was one um, shipment that was found by a recent archaeological excavation in the area that did it, it basically pointed to like exactly that like they were like the 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 heavyweights as yeah. far as like the wine goes and all that kind of stuff very cool right <laughs> very very cool um yeah and <laughs> Yeah, one other point I wanted to make was... They actually were... um, They were quite influential politically. They actually did uh, have several empires... Or empires... Emperors rule in Rome until their influence sort of waned. There was a bit of... (sighs) Sort of classic um, corruption, I would say. Um excesses, that type of thing, and their influence just waned, and then eventually they were just kind of just like all shoved these civilizations, aside. right? Shoved aside there, yeah. yeah. They were, uh, oh, and another interesting point is that you kind of said that we don't really know where they came from. Um, there has been quite extensive DNA testing on populations of people that are descendants of these Etruscans, and it does point to the idea that they originated out of Tuscany. They did not come from Turkey, as was hypothesized in antiquity and up until modern times. Crazy. Which is cool, right? Like, So they're local. They were local, yeah. Because this was my thought, was like, wait a second. There was this idea that the Etruscans had emigrated from Lydia, which is the eastern coast of present-day Turkey. And that, to me, would have pointed again to a connection to the Luwian-speaking peoples, perhaps, of earlier times. But I, uh, with this DNA evidence, that kind of throws it out the window. Hmm. Yeah. Lots to work with there. 
Lots. The last sort of potential culprit, I mean, I guess we have a few others, but I feel like this is one of the most likely, is Mm -hmm. the ancient Philistines. So Mm -hmm. the classic biblical enemies of Israel. Mm -hmm. They were thought to have come to power at the end of the ways of the Sea Peoples, very much like the Etruscans sort of hundreds of years later. Mm -hmm. But did they... Did they exist before, conquer the area, create a power vacuum, and that's why they rose up in the eras following the Sea Peoples? Mm. The Philistines would end up taking over essentially areas of Syria and modern Turkey, modern day Turkey. But there's evidence now that they existed long before the Sea Peoples arrived, leaving people to wonder if they were to blame. Mm. If the Philistines are the, the centralized power for the centralized power organizing these incursions of the Sea Peoples. I'm curious what their relations would have been with the Hittites. Well, know. this would have been the tail end of the Hittite Empire. Okay. So this is when Hittites are gone. At this, okay. Almost, okay. Like, they're, they're on the down and out at this point. That's why the city of Ugarets was so multicultural. Oh, yeah. Um, the Hittites were losing control. And it was just a hustle-bustle city. But yeah. it was, it was a, a melting, a melting pot. pot. Mm-hmm. Yeah. It's like Canada. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, exactly, right? It is possible that the Philistines were... I'm just going to read... This is a, who is a quote from... Uh, a uh, writer Alicia from McDermott. Ancient Origins, reads as follows. It's possible that the Philistines were present when many of the great civilizations collapsed and somehow they were exempt from a similar fate, which is bizarre. Mm-hmm. Large amounts of pottery and items that are identified as Philistine have been unearthed at Tel Tayanat, a site located near the border of Turkey and Syria. So these artifacts basically sh- are, are found near the ruins of an ancient city that archaeologists believe to be the real hometown, the first centralized you know, location of the Philistine Empire. And, uh, yeah, they believe that this was the capital and that this was the this was the starting point of them expanding out. Interesting. Hmm. So Syria and Turkey, that border. We do know that they definitely would have tried to expand out and do some things because uh, there's an inscription of them captured Philistine warriors on the wall at the Medinet Habu. Oh, yes. Yeah, so holding that's, that's Ramses III. Ramses III, right. Okay. So we know that they were, maybe they didn't have a good, it wasn't a successful incursion that time because there were captured Philistine slaves that were former warriors depicted on the wall. Interesting. Well, Does you that can't, mean they you were? can't win them all. Can't win them all. <laughs> yeah. I think that's honestly my favorite theory. Interesting. I, I think it's the most likely. The Philistines, you think are the most likely. Actually, sorry, I shouldn't call it my favorite. I think it's the, well, the, the most, most plausible? likely, most plausible. Interesting. Okay. Mm-hmm. Okay. I didn't hear you going off that much this week about the Philistines. Yeah, it kind of came around. But, okay, so if we're getting to favorites here or whatever, I think one of my favorite ideas, which I already introduced earlier in the episode, is the idea that uh, internal political issues and overextension of empires and resources and all this stuff could have resulted in... Yeah, these incursions. Um, like we mentioned, there was this great peace, this era of great peace, which would have displaced a lot of traditional mercenaries. And that is an economy within itself, right? War is an economy. Um, Definitely. Just talk to the people over at... Uh, oh, it's that crazy... Right, I'm not even getting into it because that's international relations. Nope, I'm not getting into that. <laughs> um, <laughs> but anyways, yeah. So my favorite idea is that... Inter- yeah, internal political issues, overextension, we've got issues of famine, drought, all this kind of stuff. Um, I feel like that could have played into desperation on the part of the most vulnerable sectors of society. And I'm talking about the poorest sectors of society. Yep. That these foot soldiers and mercenaries, these badass runners of the ancient realm, that this is who those people were. That was and their so, only job. Exactly. So once you're out of work... It's just like all the oil workers in uh, Alberta. It's like, what are you going to do? What are you going to do? You're going to make shit happen. (laughs) You're going to stir up some stuff and try and correct what you think might have been wronged. Like, so that explains a huge motivation to go after these massive empires, in my opinion. Yeah, no, I agree. So, yeah, interestingly, yes, the beginning of these sieges coincides with a time of peace. um, And, yeah... I think that, that that that's just my favorite idea, that these penniless, um, poor warriors could have banded together to form a powerful coalition of their own. I Because all cool. these people came from all corners of the Mediterranean, and yeah. they were essentially that. They were just paid fighters. Didn't matter. You didn't have to be an Egyptian to be part of the Egyptian war force. You just had to be, you know good enough to kill a few people. Yeah, to have a couple of legs and a couple of arms, and that's couple about arms, it, pretty much. A couple of legs, a couple of legs, and you're in. I guess I have to say the, my... Sorry, continue. Finish your thought. Yeah, yeah. Um, 
there was the okay so that is kind of an oversimplification of that theory that i just put forth but just for you know entertainment's sake whatever we're gonna leave it at that but there were other issues going on economic issues um there was this line of thought that reasons that like i said overextension of economic and political resources resulted in this collapse which made desperate merchants and soldiers turn to a coalition of sorts um, these could have been uh, Mycenaean Greek, like the Achaean um, populations. I have this interesting quote here, um, basically says, quote, the Achaean kings of smaller tribe, tribal groups were facing financial problems as their factories were producing about half the products compared to with the production of the 14th century. They lacked skilled craftsmen and slaves, and their territories have been plagued by overcrowding. Added to this was the um, the sea routes that they were using for trade were becoming more and more insecure. There was increasing piracy and raids, and their savings had, quote-unquote, been evaporated. Hmm. So maybe these people were like, you know what? This is going south. We should probably band together. We have a little bit of political organization, and let's just try and do this. So that's ballsy. another idea there. Mm-hmm. Definitely ballsy, that that's is, for sure. That's plausible, right, in my opinion? In my opinion. <laughs> I, well, I, that. <laughs> that, that's the opinion of a lot of historians, too, obviously. Right? True. Like, I, well, that's where we're getting this from, right? Yeah, like, I, I mean, it's... This up. No, I, I think that makes a ton of sense. Mm-hmm. I, think, I think, honestly, it's like, I feel like it's a little bit of all of this stuff, which is kind of... I don't want to take away from the story because I want it to be a massive pirate confederacy, mm-hmm. and that's part of it. But I feel like it's just, yeah, like you said, a domino effect, a bunch of different things. Possibly... Possibly these multiple incursions aren't even organized. Maybe only like three of them are organized together. And then the ones that come later have nothing to do with the first sets of incursions. It just seems to be that way. Mm -hmm. And we don't have the record of it. Possibly. But very possible. for the most part, it seems like it's really organized. And this is my favorite theory, okay? I'm not, I I take back what I said before. (laughs) I do believe that there's a chance that there were northern europeans that Ooh. were responsible for the first waves against the mycenaeans and f- more northernly groups of the aegean essentially okay. so whether or not these were vikings or er- early vikings essentially mm-hmm. like norse or coming from the rus coming from ancient russia and mm-hmm. siberia and mongolia and those types of areas i don't know like the black sea or even just central ger- germanic Europe. tribes germanic um, totally the Baltic coastline. One thing that is does correspond with this idea is that there was there were trade routes and there was the Danube, the Rhine that were basically water highways. Yes. And that um, there was such thing as the Amber Route, which was a trade route coming from the Baltic coastline where amber was sourced, um, the pre- semi precious stone. Yes. And then shipped down the line. Yeah. So it was mm-hmm. definitely. The, and, and we know for sure, too, that during this time at the end of the Bronze Age, there was trade all the way up and around the coast through to what is now modern day, the modern day UK and Ireland. True. Yeah, like along the coastline there. Mm-hmm. So people people were connected this far. The question is how, what would have caused people up that far north to come down and try yeah. to attack and without settling and things like that? Like this wasn't a force like the Nazis or something where it's like... We're coming in and we're going to occupy. Mm-hmm. You know what I mean? Like that's what take over. That's like the what motherland. Mo- exactly. Mm-hmm. That's what most most wars and things are more or less for, right? You're, yeah. You you want to take a city, you want to take a territory, or you want to take stuff from them. None of which really happens here. It's kind of like attack, eat some food, leave, <laughs> come show up again ten years later. Yeah, totally. Do it all again. It's like a big party. Right? So that sounds very Viking. It kind of does sound very Viking. And I actually came across, because I did want to explore this tangent a little further, and the idea that this could have been northern explorers, perhaps, that needed supplies, needed stuff, right? So they have to pillage as they go. Right. Um, yeah, and it, certainly the Bronze Age in the north of uh, continental Europe produced many amazing artifacts, uh, and even further right into the Scandinavian countries like uh, Sweden and all that kind of stuff. Um, there were many things uncovered. Um, one in particular was very bizarre. Uh, At first, it was the only one of its kind ever recovered. This was in Sweden, and it does not fit with local manufacture patterns, causing many to believe it came from somewhere else, somewhere down south, perhaps. And this was called the um, Balkarkra, sorry, the Balkakra 
ritual object or more simply the gong ritual object Crazy. Um, which has right. no known purpose in that culture at that time um and it was actually found in a bog in sweden like i said in this sort of rural area ominous uh, yeah very weird so description of this artifact um quote this is a quote um the item consists of a round frame made of bronze perforated with holes and carried by 10 wheels <laughs> a flat and loose bronze plate was placed on top of it. Um, the plate is decorated with zigzag patterns. Um, the diameter of the plate is 42 centimeters or 17 inches and is slightly concave. Um, interestingly, this is a continuation of the quote, an identical bronze object was found in northern Hungary near Sopron in 1913. These pieces are the only two of their kind in the world. Technique shows that they were manufactured in the same workshop, perhaps by the same craftsman. Wow. And it's quite intricate. Um, some people actually say that this was the first example of serial production in a European workshop because on each module, there are actually lines and dots. It's kind of like a number system. And they show the place of the module in the structure, which I'm not even sure what that means. That's a quote. <laughs> but essentially, it was like, it almost reminds me of the Antikythera where you get these etchings, these little ancient markers of yeah. technology. And so these were dated to be around the right time. So somewhere in between 1500 to 1000 BCE, which supports the idea that trade routes were coming from the southeast of Europe going up. And then again, right, it was just, it was a mutual thing. There were potentially trade routes all the way through to the, like, well, China all the way through, up through, right? Because mm -hmm. the, like, we, if there was mm -hmm. links between the Mediterranean and the Far East and between the Mediterranean and Northern Europe, then there would have been links between all. That was my first thought. As soon as I heard the word gong, I was like, this has to come from Asia. It but sounds very Chinese, doesn't it? It like, does because they think it might have been like um, a ritual drum for religious practices or something like that. I don't even know. It did bring to mind again the ritual mm -hmm. as like some sort of ancient magic or ancient ritual practice, which some sort we, of an occult object, which researchers have been unable to place in their, you know, in in the knowledge that they already have. So it's right. just this weird sort of anachronistic type thing. Huh. Um, so is it from trade? Is it a piece of a strange spoil of war brought back yeah. from I incursions made by Norse exactly. fighters exactly. residing in modern day Sweden? It's a lot of conjecture, a lot of whatever, but <laughs> I loved that little bit there. Um, yeah, that's really cool. I, I, yeah. I, I think that's really neat too. Yeah. We, you added this little bit in here too because... Oh, um, the Celts and the Druids. Yeah, yeah it, but, but of course this is like a thousand years out mm -hmm. of the of the ancient Celts and Druids. There would have been tribes, Germanic tribes. Um, um, yeah, it was actually dominated by the Cumulus culture of that time. And right. that was between 1600 to 1200 BCE. And basically this Cumulus culture was um, a warrior society uh, with a lot of chiefdoms, a lot of small kingdoms, um... And they, yeah, it was all over Central Eastern Europe. And they had a lot of fortified structures. They were also um, the first to kind of bury their dead, I think, in like some sort of ritual. Like in a ritual, specific ritual mm -hmm. way. It was fun though. When I was looking into these people, I actually came across this really cool, <laughs> this, just, uh, this website all about druids. And uh, there was this one quote, this is totally irrelevant to the episode, but I just like loved this. So this is 26,000 years ago in pre-Druid ancient times. This is a quote, it says here, the evidence of religious activities of prehistoric inhabitants of Western Europe is remarkable. On the Gonwar Peninsula near Swansea in Wales, the Pal Pavaland Caves have revealed one of the earliest magico-religious sites in the world where around 26,000 years ago, a group of humans carefully interred a skeleton, wrapping the body in red cloth and rubbing it with red ochre, and laying it with mammoth ivory rods, which may be the earliest magic wands ever <laughs> found. I was like, what? Oh, man. No That's way. really cool. I love that. It was like, cool. Early Harry Potter. We're not man. really getting into magic this episode and druids, but I just like I had to throw that in there. I was like, you can't not mention that. <laughs> no, totally. That's a, no, that's fascinating. Isn't There's it? a whole episode waiting right there. I yeah. think for sure. Oh yeah. Last but not least, we're gonna finish off the episode here with the craziest of all the theories that really has absolutely no basis in reality whatsoever, mm -hmm. but it's really fun and people do believe it. Yeah. And that is that the incursions of the Sea Peoples were brought on by remnants of the population of Atlantis. Yeah. And the, 
What's interesting about this theory is that the Minoans, the ancient Minoans, were the earliest uh, writing in Europe and predated the Mycenaean Greeks, were thought to be the descendants of the Atlanteans as well. Mm-hmm. That they were the sur- surviving remnants of that ancient population that were, you know, sunk into the sea, right? As Plato re- famously writes, 9,000 years before Plato or whatever it was, date wise. But it's interesting though because it kind of. If you believe there to be a population of mysterious people similar to the Atlanteans in a way, Mm -hmm. it makes sense that if they were forced to, if they were decimated in some way, that whatever remaining population of them would band with tribal factions that are also experiencing similar plights Mm -hmm. in an attempt to maybe even though, even though they weren't necessarily like a warring nation in the, in the stories of Plato, take back some of their former glory from the thousands of years prior where they mm-hmm. controlled the Mediterranean okay. and sack these em- these false empires mm-hmm. that now exist today. From a, from a, I don't know, from a narrative perspective, it's fun, but it, it makes a little bit of sense. A little bit. If you were a fallen empire and all you see in, in now left, your ca- a shadow cast over you is just... These, the Egyptians and the Hittites and these basically smaller, more mini, minuscule empires comparatively mm-hmm. that are always fighting each other and not really ever getting anywhere and not expanding to the wealth and stratus, you know, up, up into the stratosphere Could you of uh, imagine? The Atlanteans. Well, yeah, just imagine someone um, like some sort of emissary or um, ambassador of the Atlanteans coming to your chiefdom or your kingdom of an island and basically telling you this am- amazing story and, and the amazing things that you can do if you band with these legendary people. That, to me, would be quite appealing. Restore <laughs> them to their former glory. Exactly, yeah. And be a part of it. A sort of romanticized sort of vision. Yeah. So, mm-hmm. of course, pe- some people do believe this, that, that yeah, that, they, that the Minoans or maybe factions of the Minoans were left from the Atlanteans, and they're the ones who organized all of this. <laughs> I kind of like that, too. <laughs> it's yeah. It's fun. It's far out there, but, you know. I think the craziest of all, though, is that the Sea Peoples were originated from North America. Yep. That um, takes the cake, for absolutely sure. Absolutely. N- <laughs> there's no way. There's just no way. Um, not not that they couldn't have made it there, because I'm here. I am. I'm the transoceanic contact guy. Oh yeah. Definitely, there could have been peoples from uh, from the Pacific or mm-hmm. from North America that could have made it to Europe, mainland Europe. Yeah. But would they have come with hundreds of soldiers and been able to fight it would and have been... be incorporated into armies after the fact? No. Doesn't make any sense. No, it really doesn't. As cool Actually, as it I is. really like that idea of like this is a totally fictionalized narrative, but. The idea of the reversal, right, of the traditional colonial narrative where the Spanish and the Portuguese show up on the shores of North America. What if it was uh, North American natives that had actually <laughs> traversed the Atlantic and waged war on these people what and actually the decimated them? They're like, boom, all right, mic drop, we're going home. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Interesting. Yeah, I don't know. Very curious. That kind of wraps it up. It sort does. of brings us down to the end here of the Sea Peoples, this mysterious ancient story. I don't know. Ancient what you, badasses. Pretty much. See. If you were to kind of have a concluding, any concluding thoughts at all, I mean, do you have anything you want to finish off with? I I would like to say that I immensely enjoyed the research on this one. Like, like we said, there's a million rabbit holes. There's a million different names, places, peoples. I hope we didn't get too bogged down and it was entertaining for all of you guys at home and that you learned something because, like, I learned so much this week. And ancient history is just... Oh, so cool. The ancient so Near good. East is just very, very cool. Even if this is just like a completely mythological story of sea peoples that has been aggrandized over the years, yeah. like, I love it. Totally. <laughs> I love it. And I, I do stick to my guns with the idea that I think it could have been almost like a proletarian type revolution where all these like those hard done by people that yeah. were tossed aside in times of hardship because they're no longer necessary are just like pissed and they're like, you know what? Which is just so Screw cool. you all. <laughs> we're taking over. <laughs> yeah. And taking over the largest empires in the world. And that does to me, um, again, justify the idea that, yeah, they just came in wrecked everything and then basically left. And they're yeah. like, yep, that's all we wanted to do. We wanted to tear you down. Yeah. And we have, and they, and they, and like we, we went through, they, we were ushered into the dark ages and as the dark ages started to fade away and the iron age was, was soon to take off, Mm -hmm. we see people moving back down to the coasts 
away from these weird, precarious locations. Mm -hmm. We have a resurgence in philosophy in thinking and in writing. And this is where you see basically the rise of the most famous era in all of Greek history. Yeah. With the most famous philosophers that come out of it. Mm -hmm. And um, they usher in basically the era that invented democracy. Mm -hmm. More or less, I want to finish off by saying that Whatever happened in this ancient story, if it was just sea peoples or a combination of them and earthquakes and different things, what happened at the ends of, end of the Bronze Age changed the world. Mm -hmm. And it was, it's the reason we exist today the way that we do. Yeah. And it's the reason we have democracy. Mm -hmm. It's the reason that we have the engineering feats that were achieved in the Iron Age. Mm -hmm. Those might never have been possible if these power vacuums weren't created yeah. and those empires of of the Egyptians and so on, just limped and just 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 clung to their survival for another like few the thousand did. years. Yeah, exactly. Mm -hmm. Without these advancements being made. Yeah. Because the power vacuum wouldn't have been there. We could be a full thousand years behind right now. Yes, because you know? if it weren't for these incursions. Yeah. And very little people have ever heard about it. So we really so wanted cool. to bring this story to you guys. So Duh. everyone, be thankful for the sea peoples. <laughs> yes, be thankful for the sea peoples, even though they were brutal seafaring pirates yeah. that slaughtered people. They made change happen. They made it happen. So, thank you so much for listening to this episode. Oh wait, we have a, do we have a film? We got to announce the film we're going to do. It's Sunday. Uh oh. Uh oh. Uh oh. We might have to do that on uh, social media yeah, or something. We will. That's okay. We'll announce it later tonight. And uh, yeah, thank you guys so much for listening to this ancient history episode. Mm -hmm. Let us know your thoughts on what you think is the explanation for all of this. Yep. Who were the sea peoples? What is your favorite theory? Mm -hmm. Reach out to us as usual on the best places on our Facebook forum. Yeah. Absolutely love it. So search Into the Portal podcast on Facebook, click the group, join join us on there. Really want to hear what you guys think. Or you can shoot us an email into the portal mailbox, gmail.com. Yes. Come hit us up on Twitter. Follow us on Instagram mm -hmm. at Into the Portal Podcast. Give us some more followers. We yeah. want to show you guys some cool stuff that we find. Yep. And uh, we'll be back next week. Yes, we will. Mm-hmm.